Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this hour and to this place. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon each of us, that as we look at your word, we may grow in our faith, grow in our appreciation both of who you are and what you have done for us, that truly you are an incredibly awesome God, and we are so privileged to be called your children. In Jesus' name, amen. My dear friends, fellow redeemed saints uh, of the living God, a Lutheran pastor who grew up uh, in a missionary family in Papua New Guinea uh, recalls living through many of the very severe thunderstorms uh, that would take place in that region. And uh, as a child, he was quite frightened when these would happen, uh, especially in the middle of the night. And he would jump up and he would cry out, Mom, come quickly, I'm scared. And of course, mother would immediately get up and, and take her child in, in her arms, wrap her arms around him, uh, and say, it's all right. God is with you. And this young man remembered that on one occasion when this happened, he remembers replying to his mother, yes, I know that God is with me, but sometimes I need God with skin on that feeling of being held in a person's arms. And you know, the incredible thing is, my friends, we have just that. We have a God with skin on in Jesus Christ. Our God, the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, came into this world to become one of us. And He, in this world, experienced firsthand trials, afflictions, temptations, the same things that we face in our lives. He witnessed the pain of His people. Pain that sometimes was caused by guilt and shame because of their disobedience to God and His Word. Sometimes the pain and sorrow that was caused simply by sickness and death. And in our text, this God with skin on witnessed firsthand the helplessness of a father who stood by while his little daughter was dying. But we dare not let this God with skin on fool us. He became a man like us for one purpose, to become our Lord and our Savior. He experienced our every weakness except one. What was that? He did not fall into sin. The weakness of giving in to temptation. But He is still Almighty God. And He is able and He does help us in every time of need. And in our text, He invites us to do the same thing that He invited Jairus to do. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Come to Jesus in your times of fear and trouble. From our text, it would seem that Jairus came to Jesus kind of as a last resort. And we might wonder why. Why didn't he come to him sooner, as soon as his daughter got a little ill? Well, there may be a number of reasons. Perhaps uh, those large crowds that were always around Jesus, maybe he simply thought he couldn't get to him. Or maybe he thought his problems were not big enough that Jesus simply didn't have time to take care of them. Or remember, our text tells us that this man was the ruler of the synagogue. And no doubt the rabbis were already jealous of Jesus because of his great popularity. And maybe he didn't want to jeopardize his position as the ruler of the synagogue by being seen with Jesus. But by this time, he had no choice. His daughter was dying. And so with tears in his eyes, he fell down before the Lord Jesus and he pleaded, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she may be healed and live. What about you? Does your coming to Jesus sometimes take place kind of like a last resort? I think of the beautiful words uh, of that hymn writer and what a friend we have in Jesus when he says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
So do we find ourselves thinking that Jesus is too busy to listen to our small little requests? Do we think that his arms are too short to help us in our time of need? Or maybe we think that, well, Jesus is only there for spiritual situations, that he's there to forgive our sins. But my friends, he truly is a God with skin on, and he is a God who cares for us in every time and in every trouble in our lives. He is a God who's there even if it's something simply like the bills aren't being paid and we're getting behind. Or maybe we're not able to cope with the loneliness that we experience and feel and the sadness after the loss of a loved one. My friends, Jesus cares. In the text, the man pleaded to him. The next sentence was very significant. He said, so Jesus went with him. Just a simple statement of fact. But think of the comfort that there is in those words. It means that Jesus left those large crowds that were gathering around him. It means that Jesus set aside the urgency of his preaching and teaching ministry. <laughs> how, how would you like to have been the person that was in charge of, of scheduling for Jesus? Oh, there he goes again. He's never here when we need him. He's going off and helping this person and that person. Uh, how can I possibly keep track uh, and keep him on schedule? But Jairus needed Jesus at that moment. He needed a God with skin on. And so Jesus went with him. Remember before Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection, he made a promise to us, to his people. He said, surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. This promise was spoken to us by our Savior who had risen bodily from the grave. It was spoken by that one who is exalted at the right hand of God. But he is still, he is still a God with skin on. He is a God who knows our troubles. He sees our afflictions. He feels our times of sorrow. And he's saying to us, why wait until you're at the wit's end, at the end of your rope? Come to Jesus when you are troubled. And Jesus will be there with you. And Jesus will go with you through your troubles. But have you ever noticed or recognized that when, it, when we come to Jesus, when we are tested in our trials, that sometimes they don't just immediately go away? Have you ever noticed that? Doesn't seem that about the time that we reach the end of the rope, something else happens, and things just seem to get a little worse. Well, that's certainly the way it was for Jairus in our text. But remember, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. And he said those words to encourage him not to become discouraged when things get worse. You'll notice in the account, our gospel lesson for today, there, there's kind of a story within a story. While Jesus was going with Jairus to go to his home to take care of his daughter, remember what happened. A woman uh, with a blood issue reached out and touched the garment, the hem of Jesus' robe. And she was healed. And Jesus stopped. He turned around and looked for her. And then she came to him and said what had happened to her. Well, what do you think? What do you think Jairus was thinking about as all of that was taking place? Uh, Jesus, my daughter, don't forget my daughter is dying. I need you here now, not taking care of everyone else. He wanted to be by her side right now. But then it's at that very moment where you think things couldn't get worse, what happened? A man come and they said, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? How would you have felt if you were Jairus at that moment? Your only daughter was dead and you weren't there to hold her hand through that tragic, sorrowful thing. And then, why bother the teacher anymore? Those words must have been like a dagger in his heart. Why bother with anything 
anymore. Why bother with believing if God couldn't help his daughter? Why bother with being the ruler of the synagogue if being close to God doesn't make any difference when it came to his precious child? Why bother? Have you ever said that? In the struggles in your life, in those times when you've reached the end of your rope, you know those times, maybe you've prayed and you've prayed and it seems like your prayers haven't been answered. And what happens? Satan, our powerful enemy, he's quick to say, oh, Jesus is too busy. He won't bother with you. Why bother praying to him anyway? It won't make any difference. Or maybe you've prayed and you've prayed over a loved one that you wanted to get well again. But they don't. And they die. And you say, why bother? Why bother believing if he doesn't answer my prayers? Why bother with going to church every Sunday and hearing the word if when I need him he's not there for me? Why bother believing in anything at all? What difference does it make? But you know, in our text, it's at that very moment when things were at their worst that Jesus spoke those words. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And Jesus continued on his way with Jairus to go to his home and to his daughter. He wouldn't leave him alone in his time of despair. But how could Jesus say that to him? Just believe, he told Jairus. But nothing had happened yet except that Jairus had witnessed a miracle because he had seen Jesus heal that woman with the blood issue. But that's it. Nothing had happened to Jairus yet. Nothing that he knew of had happened to his daughter. Oh yeah, maybe he can heal somebody of a blood issue. Maybe he can fix a broken arm. But raise somebody from the dead? Would Jesus really do that for him now? But what do we notice about Jairus? Jairus went with him to his home. Somehow he believed that if he stayed with Jesus, Jesus would make everything all right. And you know, my friends, that's what faith is, isn't it? I think of the beautiful definition of faith in the book of Hebrews where the author says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So sometimes we don't know what's going on, what's going to happen. But faith trusts that God does. And He knows what He's doing. So when you've reached the end of the rope, the darkest hour, when you possibly cannot go any further, when it seems as if nothing's going to get better, you feel totally alone, and it can't get any worse, think of these words. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Keep going with Jesus just a little bit further because His promise is that your faith, that gift that He gives to us, your faith will not be disappointed. So what happened? When they got to Jairus' house, the mourners were already there. You know, and there was a custom in those days to hire mourners, people that would wail and cry along with the family. And Jesus came into that loud commotion and what did he say? Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And then we're told, and they laughed. We don't know if it was the professional mourners that laughed or the family. I would guess it was they more than the family. But you know, I think we can learn something from how Jesus reacted to this whole incident. In the face of such open hostility, open mockery and unbelief, what did Jesus do? He didn't say, well, if that's your attitude, I'm out of here. He didn't leave. He didn't yell at them. He simply excused all of them, and he went with Mom and Dad and Peter and James and John, and he went to the room where that baby girl was lying. And now he would see he would dem Jesus would demonstrate for this man that he truly was God with skin on. He was the Messiah. 
the promised Savior of the world. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were overcome with amazement. I love the original Greek language for that overcome with amazement. Uh, it literally, if we did it literally word for word, it would say they were ecstatic with ecstasy. They were overcome with joy and happiness. Have you ever felt ecstatic with ecstasy? Can you imagine how that felt for Jairus? I don't know if we can. But someday, my friends, we will. Because in a way, we have also been asked to make the same leap of faith that Jairus was to make. Think about it. We stand by the grave of a loved one, maybe a father or a mother, a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife. And Jesus says to us at that moment, don't be afraid. Just believe your loved one is asleep, is only sleeping. Can we make that leap of faith? Can we look at the lifeless body of our loved one and believe these words of Jesus? He's only sleeping. Don't forget we're after Easter. We can and we must. Because, my friends, our God with skin on proved His power over death. He raised Jairus' daughter, didn't He? He raised the young man at Nain. He raised Lazarus from the dead. But most importantly, He Himself rose from the dead on that first Easter. And remember what happened? The disciples touched the risen Savior, God with skin on it. So my friends, truly, we will one day be ecstatic with ecstasy. We too will rise from the dead on that last day. We will witness the resurrection of our loved ones. We will leave the troubles and the trials and the tests and temptations of this world behind. And we will eternally be with our God with skin on, with Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying to us this morning, He is saying to each one of us in our times of trouble and sorrow, don't be afraid. Just believe. May God give to each of us that kind of faith. A faith that trusts in God, that knows that that God with skin on is my Lord and my Savior. And He's got all the power. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen.